Right, episode four of roulette system testing. So far, we have seen that larger coverage flat bets lose more than smaller coverage flat bets. Although all the flat bets we tested when played in a clockwork manner lost money over the 40,000 test spins. In the last episode, we tested a progression bet. Progression betting is a large topic on its own. So we simply started with the infamous Martingale system, betting on red, just to get some basic results. We then provided test results using a profit target, a stop loss limit and a trigger, but none of those results were ideal. We ended the video showing results from a test that made an average 36% profit over 40 sessions in a row. Now we are not suggesting this is a life-changing roulette breaking system that will never fail. However, beating 40 sessions in a row shows these are not results from a handful of lucky sessions. Turning a negative 2.7% game like roulette into a positive 36% return for 40 sessions in a row is a distinct example of how harnessing the power of math and the patterns that form in random results can help you improve your results. So, we will be covering that in detail today, but there are three things we're going to do first. 1. There were some interesting points made in the comments on the last video, so I want to run through those. 2. We're going to talk about infinity in relation to roulette results and how a better understanding of infinity will help us with predictions. In this video, we open up the topic so we are able to refer back to it in future videos. And three, we're going to delve deeper into our favorite topic, geometric data, which will lead us nicely into explaining how we beat the 40 sessions in test 12. So let's get on with it. A big thank you to everyone who comments on the channel. We do try and read all comments and respond where we can, although it is getting harder and more time consuming. So, highlighting a few comments along with our thoughts in future episodes when relevant, we feel should benefit everyone. Apologies in advance if we miss some and don't include yours. First up is, and I hope this is pronounced correctly, Dikasma, saying he uses a preset program with very high trigger points. We produced a video called Why Clockwork Roulette Systems Fail, yet in an earlier video we also said clockwork bets have their place if used sparingly. And Dikasma's point is along the lines of what we meant. He says about using very high triggers like loss level 20 on an even money bet, which makes some sense. If you looked at the table, we produced in the Why Clockwork Roulette Systems Fail video. However, you couldn't just play that as a single system. The reason being, even triggering at loss level 4 like we did in the previous video, we were down to only a few betting opportunities per hour. If you are waiting to see a level 20 loss opportunity, you will be waiting a long time. That said, if you're using some form of roulette tracking software, or even just a spreadsheet, there is no reason why you couldn't monitor multiple potential bets at the same time. If you consider betting on the standard even money 18 pocket bets on the roulette table starting at level 20, there are six potential bets that could occur. As you can see with a loss level 20 trigger, there were only a few bets that occurred over the 40,000 spins. We tried again triggering at loss level 15, you can see we get a couple more bets, but the bets that would have started at level 20 of course play much earlier, risking more without any additional profit. Playing again from a loss level 10 trigger of course gives us even more opportunities, but the few bets that reached higher loss levels become unacceptable from an ROI point of view, so the triggers need to stay high and the opportunities are rare. We know from the Hidden Patterns Part 2 video that there are over 17 billion ways to make a set of 18 pockets out of a possible 37 pockets, so you would need to monitor a large number of sets to improve the method. The idea of waiting for a high loss trigger still holds some merit, but like the basic flat bet trials we did, multiple smaller sets are likely to produce better results. We will explore that concept again in later videos. Next up is a comment from another channel, Roulette Profit and Stop. Again, there are some interesting points here to consider, but we have to take them into the context of a player's personal circumstances or overall strategy. Our next green thumbnail video is meant to be about strategy, but each time we start writing it, we realize there are just so many variables to consider as everyone plays roulette differently with their own unique experience, knowledge of systems, available bankroll and profit expectation to say the least. So that video is on hold until we get further into this series and we have shown a lot more trial results, allowing for a better understanding of how to create an overall strategy tailored to your own personal situation. So, the profit and stop, or the get in and get out approach, may work well for those with larger bankrolls like All on Black or Casino Matchmaker, where they both play high coverage systems and seem to make a reasonable return. However, such systems are a real grind for smaller bankrolls. Incidentally, we tried the All on Blacks, 
CYA, or cover your ass system with a small amount of money on the instant roulette wheels. We lost on the first spin, and it didn't get any better. In fact, we lost it all within about 30 spins. Just look at how bad these results are. We are covering 32 pockets. We have over 86% chance of winning. By 18 spins, we have lost five times, and that's because pocket 36 has had four wins. By the time we deplete our bankroll, you can see we have lost 11 times out of 33. That's an incredible 33% loss rate and two and a half times more than expected. 35 also had four wins. Are we really that unlucky? This is something we will be looking at much closer in series two of Do Casinos Cheat. Going back to the comment we agree. It's true. There hasn't been a holy grail system found in 400 years. Unless of course you watch the roulette master, who seems to find a new one every day which I think is one of the points being made here. Roulette Profit and Stop doesn't mention what systems he uses here, and we haven't had time to watch his videos, but I assume he has a number of systems and switches between them much like AOB does. Depending on what systems are being used, Boris also makes a valid point. Shorter plays played long-term simply accumulate statistically if they are clockwork systems. Okay, last set of comments from Grahitwaha, and I'm sorry I've probably pronounced that incorrectly, just to clarify, there isn't really ever going to be a final strategy or system to beat roulette, just like there isn't a final strategy to beat the stock market or poker game. What is possible, though, is to increase your knowledge of statistics and probability to improve your results. Building a toolkit of viable systems which contribute to an overall strategy is the key. When I first started to take roulette seriously, I spent a lot of time studying gamblers like Edward Thorpe, horse racing gambler William Benter, and traders like Jim Simmons. A lot of the techniques they use can be applied to roulette betting strategies. I did, however, start with an assumption that turned out to be wrong. I thought roulette should be easier to crack than horse racing or the stock market, because to win on the stocks I thought I needed deep knowledge of markets like Warren Buffett, or for sports betting a good deal of knowledge about horses or football. When I realised Benter was not an expert in equestrian matters per se, and Simmons' understanding of the markets was nothing like Buffett's, I was fascinated to learn that both of them developed algorithmic methods to analyse and make profitable predictions over their depth of knowledge on the actual subject matter. Now I assumed roulette would be easier to beat as every pocket is equal. Horses can have a bad day, or be getting older, or might not do so well in longer distance races, etc. The variables are vast. Same with the stock market where I would argue there are far more factors to consider. A roulette wheel only has 37 possible outcomes, so how hard can it be? Well, the actual problem is that all pockets are perfectly equal. Unlike horse racing and stock trading, where trends and outcomes are influenced by measurable factors and causal relationships, the probabilities, odds and payouts in roulette remain constant. The individual pockets are never over or undervalued by bookmakers or the market, making it much harder to find an edge or exploit any bias. But it's not impossible. There are many patterns to be found in seemingly random data. Think back to the beginning of this video, where we showed the results of 40 sessions winning in a row. That isn't random luck. Anyway, it's the reply Grahit came back with what really caught our attention. From the first comment, I wasn't sure he understood where our channel was heading. But from his next comment, we can see he completely understands us. If you asked us to define what beating roulette really is, then we would say the ability to predict the next winning number on every spin. Only at that point, roulette is truly beaten. Of course we don't expect to ever achieve that, but then again, Noah probably never thought about taking two of every species to Mars, or calling Mrs Noah from his cell phone to say I can't find it. The sat-nav keeps directing me to Uranus. Maybe in the future some development in quantum computing and AI will get us to the point of predicting every spin accurately, but of course that would be the end of roulette and gambling in general. And if that ever happens, gambling will be the least of our worries, as encryption and the security of practically everything on the planet will also be compromised. But we are digressing again. So, hypothetically speaking, predicting the next win on every spin must surely be the ultimate measure, even if it's unattainable. So, Grahit seems to grasp where we are heading, but there is no simple answer we can hand you. You must do your own research, learn from as many different sources as you can. Practice, experience and knowledge are just as important in roulette as any other discipline you want to become great at. And here's a tip we learned from Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Learn it like you are going to teach it. That's quite a profound thought, and it plays a part in the existence of this channel, 
We are not just doing this because we are awfully nice people. Now, Spools and Boris, like many, don't believe this can be done. And it's true, mathematically speaking, it's impossible to change the house edge with a clockwork system. However, we are not looking at the game in that sense. There is a possibility that casinos protect themselves from systematic players. In our Do Casinos Series 1 videos, we have only been placing a small flat bet and the spins have been statistically spot on with expectation. However you saw earlier, we tried AOB's CYA high coverage system and lost straight away. In Series 2, we will be doing things differently. We will be playing a system similar to Test 12 and seeing how real results compare to tests done on our simulator. We will soon see if the statistically correct spins from Series 1 look different in Series 2. Right, enough. Let's move on and put some thought into infinity. Asking how big is infinity is perhaps a daft question, but asking are there different sizes of infinity might become more thought-provoking. There are some fun mathematical concepts you might have heard of like the infinite monkey theorem, which suggests that if you have an infinite number of monkeys, each randomly pressing keys on a typewriter, given enough time, at least one of the monkeys will eventually type the complete works of William Shakespeare. Or the infinite hotel, where there's always room for another guest, that one can really bend your mind. But what does this have to do with roulette? Well, if we are considering the infinity of roulette results, we should consider temporal limits. Temporal limits are the practical constraints on how long something can happen for, considering the somewhat finite nature of time in a real-world situation. Let's think of it like this. Hypothetically, if you sat watching a wheel operating at 80 spins per hour, it would take you about 20 days to see the equivalent of our 40,000 spins. To see a million spins would take about a year and a half. You'd be fairly tired and bored. At 10 million spins, it's just over 14 years' worth of your existence. And even Jeanne Calment, the French woman who lived for 122 years and 164 days, the longest living person in recorded history, wouldn't have been able to watch 100 million spins. So if we considered 100 billion spins, which would take over 52 million days of observation, or 142,000 years, then arguably this could be used as a practical upper limit. But what's with all this crazy talk, RP, I hear you cry? Let's turn it back around. If 52 million roulette players observe just one day's worth of spins each, then some of them will see some extreme results, and it's completely possible that someone somewhere could have seen seven zeros in a row. But what's the chance of seeing something so extreme a second time? Is it possible that one person was born lucky and gets to see all the favourable results, while another person gets to see all the extreme bad results? Is there really such a thing as luck? It doesn't work like that. Let's think of grains of sand to explain this in another way. When you keep pouring sand onto the same spot, the grains don't land neatly on top of one another. To the naked eye, they seem to fall randomly, but over time the pile grows higher and spreads wider. Of course, the sand falls according to the laws of physics, while roulette results follow the laws of probability. Yet, they seem to demonstrate similar characteristics. Both build patterns over time that might appear random in the moment, but when viewed on a larger scale, reveal consistent and predictable tendencies. So, the growth is generally smooth and predictable. You wouldn't expect sudden large bumps to form in the sand pile unless there's some form of tortious interference disrupting the natural process. It's the same with the geometric loss levels of roulette results. Of course, depending on the number of pockets you are monitoring, the height of the pile and the width of the spread alter, but the principle is the same. Like our grains of sand, the results do not land or form perfectly, but over time the pattern is completely predictable and grows within certain constraints. So assuming there aren't any hidden forces at work, you cannot end up with massive bumps in your graphs, and all players should experience similar. The more results you see, the smoother the graph should be, so as the results head towards infinity, the proportional representation becomes more accurate. Now, let's look at the new geometric tool we have added to the free roulette enthusiast area of our website, which will provide some insight to how we changed the bets in trial 12 to beat 40 sessions in a row. The geometric loss level calculator is similar to the Excel one we showed you how to build in the Y Clockwork Systems Fail video, However, it has an additional feature. It allows you to split the results into two sections for particular loss levels. But hang on, let's come back to that in a minute. We should really take this opportunity to check the accuracy of our 40,000 RNG spins in the geometric loss level sense first. Let's check how accurate the geometric loss levels for red are. 
A lot of the time when we are looking for answers we don't need to run the simulator, we can simply query the SPIN database. We already know from previous videos that reds were slightly behind black over the 40 sessions, and that's why we chose them for test 12. Even though we knew black would have produced better results, we didn't want anyone to say that was behind the reason. We still got good results from the known underperforming set of pockets. We can see like the grains of sand analogy, the results are not perfect, but the prediction is still very accurate. It's this level of predictive power that can help us design winning roulette systems. So, let's look at test 12 in detail. In the last video, we were looking at negative bets. We were playing progressions on the assumption the bet has to win at some point in the future, and of course it will win. We just don't know when. And of course it can often run beyond the scope of our bankroll or table limit. We can see beyond a certain point there are less results, and they spread wider. So even if we set a negative trigger point where we wait for a number of losses like level 4 or higher, then thanks to infinity, we still don't know where our progression will end. However, if we think about a positive trigger, where we wait until our set wins, we can see there are a rich number of results that occur within a few spins. So, we can operate a play and park system. If we set the split to level 2, it actually includes three levels. Level 0 is a repeat win. Level 1 means a win after one loss. And level 2, of course, means a win after two losses. You can see playing for three spins after a win, we have over 86% chance of winning. So, the actual method we used in test 12 was a standard martingale progression. But first we wait for red to win, then we play the progression for three levels. If we don't win, we park the bet and wait until red wins again, then we continue with the progression for another three spins and so on. So, we are effectively stacking up our martingale progression and playing from a dynamic point in the game where after we can expect a higher concentration of wins. Playing after a win is an example of using a positive trigger. Playing after a loss level is a negative trigger. You can probably see now why people playing follow the winner on a dozen, or even money bet, will generally do quite well. Casino matchmaker often says he follows the winner just because he likes playing that way. And it doesn't matter which set of X number of pockets you play relevant to his demonstration. But as you can see, that's not true. It does make a difference. If you've been following our channel, then you will probably know we are not fans of high coverage bets. And that includes the even money, 18 pocket size bets, although they are often a lot easier to use in a first demonstration. The obvious reason we don't like the standard Martingale 18 pocket bet is you only win back your initial stake as profit, no matter how many levels you play for. You can now, of course, use the geometric loss level calculator alongside a progression calculator and try different size bets with different split level or parking points. We will, of course, be producing more trial results soon. However, a word of warning, the method demonstrated today when played on its own will still fail. It was only intended to show that you can alter the outcome of a roulette session by understanding the data that forms in random results. Sorry again, phallicists. William Benter's horse racing prediction model looked at 120 different data points. The demonstration for test 12 only considered one thing, geometric loss levels. So although it demonstrated an improvement, this by no means constitutes the holy grail. So please don't waste too much money trying this out. But we will be adding additional methods, including things like funneling and our wisdom of the pockets approach. So if you want to see more and be notified when the next video is out, you know what to do.